So we're in Luke chapter 17, and I'm going to speak from verse 5 through 19. So we're going to cover a lot of, a lot of verses this morning. And uh, again, you, you need to make sure you put uh, double the offering in the bag because you're getting a two for this morning, two for the price of one, two messages in one. So... <laughs> All right, so uh, Luke chapter 17, reading from verse 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. But will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all these things which are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face and at his feet, keeping, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. So we looked at the first part of chapter 17 last week. And remember that we've said that these things are all connected. They are not just isolated ideas that are just inserted in between. The issue of increasing our faith is in the, in the light of the fact that Jesus had just given them some very strong, difficult commands. The first being, don't be a cause of offense. The second is, if your brother causes you... Uh, offense there, or uh, sins against you, then rebuke him. Uh, the one who is rebuked must be, repent. The one who uh, has been repented to, if you will, must forgive. Um, these are things we don't have options about. These are things that must be done. And they are all very, very difficult. Um, and so in that light, uh, the disciples say, well, Lord, you better help us. Increase our faith. Now, you, you'll see that verse 5 begins, and the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the word and tells us that this is not just a statement concerning faith. This is a statement that has to do with the commands that Jesus has just given. The commands that deal with offenses and with uh, rebuke and with repentance and with forgiveness. Now, he then tells a parable, and that's where we're going to start this morning in verse 7. And which of you? So again, this is connected to the whole beginning of chapter 7. So, so you see, here's the problem, is that uh, preachers tend to, and, and obviously we, we can't deal with a whole section in one go. That would mean we'd be here for four or five hours. Um, so we, we have to do it in 45-minute segments, and then we, we get the impression, well, you know, the story about the servant and his master, well, that's a separate story. It ha really has no connection to what has gone before. And obviously the way we read it is the same way... Um, but the point is that this is part of the same, the same message that begins at the beginning of chapter 17 and continues. And so it begins with the word and. So this is not a freestanding parable. This is a parable that is connected to what Jesus has just taught. So let's have a look at it. And it's a, it's a pretty simple parable. Um, 
uh, again, may be a little offensive to us in our modern understanding of things, um, but the point is very, very clear and very relevant. Which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, and the word servant there, slave, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. Now, remember that these slaves were live-in slaves. They lived in, sometimes even in the house, but certainly on the property. And, um, and so he, he's out in the field, he's worked all day, and he comes home, and uh, he, he, Jesus is saying, well, where's the master the owner of the slave, who's going to say, well, come and sit down. I'm going to serve you. And obviously, in the context of the time, that, that, sounds, that sounds ludicrous. It's crazy. But which master is going to serve a slave? The slave serves the master. And that's the point. Now, this is not a statement about slavery. Um, and we, I, I don't want to get into that whole thing. Um, so who's going to do this? And obviously, the answer is no one. But this is what will happen. But will he not rather say to him, the master say to the slave, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. He's saying, is that not the way it would happen? This again is not a statement as to what is fair or what is right. And obviously, we would agree that it is not fair for a slave or a servant or an employee to do double duty. Um, I, I think there are probably laws against that today. So if you have someone who works eight hours in a business, um, when he's finished the eight hours, you say, well, now go and wash my car. Um, I, I think you'd get into serious trouble for that these days. Um, so this is not a statement about what is right and wrong as far as... But, but there's, a, there's a point. Remember, these parables have a point. And sometimes the parable is, um, is, is um, inflammatory uh, because it, he's wanting us to think. And we, and we say, well, yeah, of course. You know, this is what we would expect, but is this, is this, is this right? Uh, that the servant, having worked all day now has to come home and now cook the meal for the master. And probably in the context of the time, even wash the master's feet and then, you know, prepare the meal. And, uh, and then he can eat and then go to, go to bed. And so verse 9, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him or commanded him? I think not. Now, Again, in our context, we would say, well, that's pretty rude. And, and yet, it's pretty common today. I often watch people in restaurants. Well, we don't often go to restaurants, but when we do, I watch people. Uh, thankfully, today, there's not too many people, and so we have space. But when the waiter comes, or the, what's the PC word now? The server comes. Very few people say thank you. Why? It's their job. That's what they paid for. So the server puts the food down. Well, you know, I want salt and I want, uh, I want sauce and I want this and I want that and I want the other thing. The waiter runs, brings the stuff. And uh, again, no thank you. I think that's rude. And yet, it does play into this parable. Why does the master not thank the servant for doing double duty? Because it's his job. He is a slave. He doesn't have a choice. That's what he's there for. And that's the very point that Jesus is making. He's, remember, he's not making a point about social justice and all of these kinds of things. Here's the point. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which are commanded. Which are the things that are commanded? Well, obviously, this would include all of the New Testament. Much of the Old Testament. 
but specifically in the context of the passage. Because remember the little word and. When you don't cause offense, when you rebuke someone who does wrong, when you repent, when you forgive, these are the immediate things Jesus has in mind. And remember, these are difficult things to do. So when you've done all these things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what is our duty to do. That's the point. You see, when we do any of these things, we expect the Lord and certainly others around us to pat us on the back and say, hey, you did good, brother. And not just these things that we've been speaking about, offending and rebuking and repenting and forgiving, but, but anything. I think pastors are more guilty of this than anyone. And, and, and this does not mean that pastors must be disrespected. And, 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 and you know, sometimes people are very un, ungrateful for the work that pastors do. And yet at the same time, the point is that we are unprofitable servants. We are, unpro again the word servants, they're slaves. We have been bought with a price. We are simply doing our duty. You know, there are actually Christians who expect to be, to be commended for coming to church for four weeks in a row. No, you, you've just done your duty. You've just done what you should be doing. I, I guess it has something to do with our modern way of raising children again. Sorry to get back to that. But it seems you get a prize at school for anything these days. When in fact all you've done is what was expected. You've just done what is the right thing. You don't need a prize to be on time because you're on time. You don't need a prize because you attended faithfully. And folk, here's the, here's the problem is that our, our human way of doing things in, comes into the church. And we, we, we feel that, you know, that God has to reward me every time I do anything. Whether it's praying or reading the scriptures or being faithful in the meetings or witnessing to someone or um, helping someone else. Whatever it is. But we're unprofitable servants. We are slaves. And we are simply doing our duty. We're simply doing what we have been saved to do. Because that's why he saved us. That we might serve him. And again, you see, here's our, our problem. Because we say, well, you know, this, this idea of serving, that's not, you know. No, Jesus is my brother and I'm co-heir with him and I'm going to inherit all of eternity. And, and of course these things are true. Of course he's brought us into a relationship of love with himself and with the Father. And yet at the same time, we are not equal to him. He is still the master. And we are still the slaves. Because we have been bought with a terrible price. And therefore, whatever we do, we cannot expect payment because the payment has already happened. It happened 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary. That's where he paid us. And obviously he didn't pay us, but that's where the price was paid. And now we say, well, you know, he, he paid this terrible price, not silver or gold, but his own precious blood. But that's not good enough. Now that I'm saved... Now he's going to reward me every time I do something right. 
No, he's already rewarded me by saving me, by calling me through his grace and bringing me into a relationship with himself, forgiving me, making me his son, making me an heir and co-heir with Christ. He has already done these things for us. You see, we, we have exactly the same mindset in the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says, well, we, you know, he died for us at the cross, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to do something. I'm going to give him money, and then he's going to give me something back. No, we don't give God money because we want money back. We give to him because he first gave to us. The only basis on which I can expect something in return, whether it's in my giving money or giving time or service or whatever it is, the only time I can expect anything back is when I discount the cross. And I say, that doesn't matter. It doesn't count anymore. That's done. It's passed. Now I want to be rewarded for what I'm doing now. Now, we understand that God is gracious and he does reward us. But he doesn't always reward us when we want that reward. He doesn't always bless us when we want the blessing. And sometimes those rewards and blessings are deferred, and sometimes they're deferred a long time, and they may only come in heaven. But they will come. And yes, we know there's going to be the judgment seat of rewards, the Bema seat, where all of us will appear before him and we'll receive rewards. For the things that we have done. Does he have to reward us? No, he doesn't. But you see, here's the problem. It's not whether he rewards us or not. It's our expectation. It's our expectation. We feel entitled, therefore God must bless me because I did my duty. No, I do my duty because God has already blessed me. Because he's already saved me. Because he's already given me everything that pertains to life and to godliness. And so we've got to, we, we can't get away from the cross. We can't get away from the fact that that's where everything began. And that's the basis of everything that we have today. And so we serve him because he first served us. He became, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. We give to him because he first gave to us. We love him because he first loved us. And not only do we do these things to him, but we do them to our brethren. So we love one another because he loved us. We forgive one another because he forgave us. We have, we have patience with one another because he has patience with us. We encourage one another because he encourages us. And so everything we do is on the basis of what he has already done for us. And so we are but unprofitable slaves. We're not entitled to anything. And yet in his goodness and his grace, he pours upon us blessing upon blessing. And when the blessing doesn't come at the, at the moment that we expect it, we get the socks. Oftentimes we're looking for that reward to come from other believers. Oh, nobody ever thanks me for what I do. And folk, I, I understand. I, I, I get into that situation quite often. I'll confess that readily. But we have no reason to complain because we are not entitled to anything. And when we understand God's em enormous grace towards us that saved us when we were not entitled to anything but his wrath and his judgment. When we understand that, we under uh, it, that deals with entitlement. Because we, we, we come to a place where we're just grateful, Lord, for saving me. And everything else is extra. Now, the next story, and it's, the next one is not a parable, is connected to this one also. Because it deals with the issue of thankfulness. So, why would the slave be disgruntled if his master 
asks him to do double duty and does not thank him. Because he's not thankful for his master. You say, well, you know, again, uh, we, we have a problem. How can, you know, how can a slave be thankful for his master? Remember that many of the, most of the slaves, particularly in Judaism, were well treated those days. And many, um, many men and, and, and women sometimes would become slaves willingly because it was the only way out of, out of debt. And it was better to be a slave where the master took care of you, fed you, housed you, provided for you, than trying to make it out on your own. And so, the, so it, it, was, it wasn't all bad. We're, we're looking at slavery in this context of the Jewish context, where he, they would serve for six years, they would go out on the seventh year. There were very, very specific rules about how they were, be, were to be treated. Um, and so we're, we're not looking at it from a Roman point of view, but from a Jewish point of view. And so the next parable, a story, is really very simple, and yet, again, so profound. Now it happened, as he went through Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. All right, now, just by the way, a technical thing here. Remember how Luke is reminding us that this is on his way to Jerusalem. It's on his way to the cross. Covers many chapters in the book of Luke. One of the problems is that you cannot plot Jesus' journey based on the places that Luke mentions. Because they're higgledy-piggledy. They, they, they're, they're all over the place. Luke is not giving us a sequential um, um, travelogue of Jesus' journey, starting in Galilee and ending in Jerusalem. And so he went, goes from this place to this place to this place to this place in a straight line. What Luke is writing is he's writing, I, I guess you can call it topically, in other words, he's dealing with subjects. And sometimes those subjects were taught here and over there. And he puts them together. Because he is dealing with one subject at a time, just as we're seeing here in Luke chapter 17. And so he may take something that happened further down the road and put it earlier on in the, in the journey. Because he's not giving us a travelogue. He's not giving us a cr chronological order of Jesus' journey. But he's saying... On his journey to the cross, these are the things that he taught. And he's grouping them together in things that fit together. All right. So he, he's going to Jerusalem. He's passing through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. So it seems on the border of the two, of the two areas. Remember, these are regions. They are not cities. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men. So he's just coming into the village and there are these lepers, and they are standing afar off. This is what the law required of them. They had to remain a certain distance, um, and the distance was uh, 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 very interesting. I, I, I sometimes think that, you know, I, I don't always understand why th these things are the way they are, uh, but it had to be a stone's throw away. So uh, today we say six feet. Um, now that's less than a stone's throw. Um, but that was to be as far as you could throw a stone at someone. Uh, so the, the point was that there had to be separation because of the contagious nature of the disease. And this was prescribed in the law. This is prescribed particularly in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and uh, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. And, and so what we're experiencing today is not uncommon. Uh, folk, he, uh, th there are so many issues that revolve around this COVID thing, and I, and I really don't want to get into it in a big way. But there are Christians who have a real problem with the idea of isolating or um, uh, um, quarantining. And, and I understand that there are countries, particularly Australia and New Zealand, that are draconian and unjust and unfair in the way that they deal with us. But the way that we deal with it here, certainly in this, in this state, is, is not unfair. The principle is that if someone has something that is, that is contagious, you need to separate from them. 
And some of you have experienced that as you were locked in your room for 10 days. We're not able to come to church for that period. We're not able to go to work for that period. This is not something new. This is not something that, that any government in the world has thought up. And I'm not talking about, you know, there's so, so much about this, but, but the idea of isolating those who have contagious diseases is a principle that God established from the very, very beginning. And so they were to be outside of the city. They couldn't live with other people. And clearly they can see from here that they would stick together because, you know, you can't, you know, you can't inf uh, infect someone with something that they already have. Um, so, so the lepers would come together. And, and, and in fact, in South Africa, they, they used to, when I was a young man, I don't know whether they're still there, but when I was a young man, we had leper colonies, areas where, where leprous people lived. And I used to go and preach in one of those colonies every Sunday afternoon for a couple of years. Um, and so uh, they, they, would, they would hang out together. They couldn't come into the city. They had to keep a distance. And so they're standing afar off and they're calling out to Jesus. They, they clearly recognize him. They, they've heard about him. They've heard who he is. And so uh, as he comes into the village, they're outside the, 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 the town, and they meet him, and they stand afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So the fact that they call him Master, Curious, Lord, re they recognize who he is. They recognize that he, in fact, may have an answer to their problem. Have mercy on us. Have pity on us. I'm not sure what they were asking for. They, they may be asking for money. But I think in recognizing who Jesus was, they're not asking for money, but they're asking for healing. Because remember, Jesus had healed many, many people. This is still very close to Galilee where he performed most of his miracles. So they recognized that he was able to heal. And so when they saw him, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. So uh, this is interesting because Jesus dealt with another leprous man that he actually touched. In this case, he doesn't touch them. But he says, go and show yourselves to the priests. Now, Leviticus 14 tells us that uh, if you had leprosy and you believed you were cured, you needed to go to the priests and the priests were effectively the health officers those days. And the priest would uh, examine you. And, the, and the, in fact, the law gives all sorts of prescriptions as to if it looks like this, uh, it is. And if it looks like that, it is not. Um, uh, so uh, so, so to, today, Jesus would say, go and get a COVID test. <laughs> That's effectively what he is saying. Um, not, not in the sense of, you know, obviously the, the point is not, you know, go and find out whether you have leprosy. They know they've got leprosy. And clearly the evidence is clear because they're able to see one another and they're able to see that they're healed. Um, and so Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. Now, that, 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 that's an amazing statement. Or, or, in fact, an amazing response, should I rather say, on the part of, of them. Because it says, so as it was that they went. They have this terrible disease. There is no cure for it. Not those days. And Jesus says, go to the priests. Go and show yourself. Not go and ask them to help you. Go and be examined. And they go. This shows faith. They, even though the evidence was still there, they recognized that Jesus told them to go, and they go. And folk, again, sometimes God asks us to do things which seems to be impossible. And in the context of the passage, He asks us to forgive, and sometimes we just cannot forgive. But we need to be obedient. Sometimes he asks us to rebuke. And I think sometimes it's harder to rebuke than it is to forgive. It's 
It's one of the hardest things that, you, 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 that God can ask you to do. I had to write a long letter to a brother this last week. It was one of the most difficult things I've done for a long time. But when he tells us to do things, let's do them. Let's be obedient. Because as they went, they were cleansed. How did they know? Well, clearly they could see the signs. Now, I know that we, we have this um, myth, I think, that the uh, leprosy causes fingers and arms and legs to fall off, nose and ears. Um, that's not what leprosy does. Um, leprosy removes sensitivity from the extremities. And as a result, you do things to yourself that you don't feel. Put your hand in the fire and you don't feel that you're burning and so you don't... And that's why things f fall off. They don't fall off. Um, whether, whether their fingers and things were restored, it doesn't say. I think not. Because it says they were cleansed. They were cleansed. In other words, the disease was taken away from them. Because remember, one of the things that they had to shout when someone came close is, unclean, unclean. In other words, I'm infected, I'm infected. So if they were unclean, now they are clean. And that was the whole point of the priests examining them to make sure that they were clean uh, so that they could enter into normal life again. So they somehow recognized something had happened, and they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, here's another word, healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. You can see the connection with the previous passage. The slave who expects a reward, is not thankful. He doesn't recognize what God has done. The, ten who, the nine who didn't come back, why didn't they come back? Well, maybe they were so excited about what was happening and they, was, they, they just couldn't wait to get to the priests so that the priests could declare them clean and they could go back to their families. Th that's part of it. But surely they should have come back and thanked Jesus. Because this was, this, you know, and while we've drawn some parallels to COVID, this is not COVID. This is a life sentence that these guys had. They, they would die out there, never being able to, to hold their loved ones, never, be, never ever being able to be part of the society again, never able to come to the temple or the synagogue and to be healed. Is, a, is an enormous thing. And you would think that there would be gratitude. But only one comes. Is, is Jesus giving us a statistic that would be true today? Well, I don't know. I, I don't think you can deal with the numbers that way, but I think that there is a principle. And the principle is that of those that are cleansed of their sin. Remember that that's, this is the problem. We, we didn't have... We didn't have COVID. We didn't have leprosy. We had something far worse. And it was called sin. And it was something that did not just separate us from other people. It separated us from God. It left us outside of His city, the New Jerusalem. And it carried with it a prognosis of death. And every one of us had it, but He healed us. He cleansed us forgave us. But now when we do something for him, we expect a reward. When he doesn't, when people don't recognize what we're doing for the Lord, we get all grumpy. Instead of living our lives with gratitude and with worship. And, and I know I've mentioned John Newton so many times, and yet there is for me no greater example of a man who lived the rest of his life constantly in amazement and in awe 
of that grace that saved a wretch like me. And folk, I believe that we need to be like John Newton. We need to be like this man who live our lives in absolute worship and adoration that he saved me. You see, but we, we don't because we feel entitled again. We say, well, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. I've got a good education and I've got a good background and, um, you know, I'm an American citizen, so I need to be saved. God needed me. No, God doesn't need any of us. He saved us because of, of His immense grace and mercy. And there needs to be a returning to Him. And, and notice, he, he, he returned and with a loud voice. Now, the, the, the Greek word is interesting because from that Greek word, we get the word megaphone. Megaphone. So he was shouting it out. He didn't have a megaphone, but he, his voice was as loud as he, could, as he could get it. Glorifying God. Recognizing it wasn't chance. It wasn't his goodness. It was God through Jesus. Whether he understood Jesus was God, I, well, I don't know how, much he, how far his theology went. But he recognized that it was God working through the Lord Jesus that had healed him. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. See, there's the punchline again. He was the most unlikely character. The most unlikely character. The others were good, upstanding Jews. Folks, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter our education, our background, our ethnicity, our denomination. Those are not the things that matter. What matters is our response to Jesus. That's the thing that matters. And often it's those who are least likely who have the right response. And of course there's only one response. I don't deserve anything. I'm an unprofitable servant. But Lord, you've saved me. You've cleansed me. And so Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? And the, the language here is that this is not a rhetorical question. This is not a question which Jesus knows the answer to, but it's a question of amazement. Remember, Jesus is a man. He's only understanding what the Father reveals to him. He's limited his divine uh, privilege and, and power. And Jesus is, is shocked. He's amazed. That's what the, 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 the Greek says. When they're not ten, where, where are the others? Surely they should have come back. Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God, except this foreigner, this stranger, Gentile? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. So here's the Here's the powerful thing. When it says, your faith has made you well, the Greek word, sorry for the Greek words, but the Greek word is sozo. And if you know a little bit about Greek, you know that that word is the word save or saved. Your faith has saved you. See, the others got physical healing. This man got spiritual healing in addition to his physical healing. Now again, let's, just, let's get it straight. It doesn't mean that when we are thankful that God blesses us because we are thankful. The point is that we are unprofitable servants. We need to be thankful for what he has done, whether, and that's end of the, the end of the story. But clearly in this case, because the man responded... He gets what the others didn't get. 
The others got physical healing. This man, in addition, got salvation. Your faith has saved you. And so, folk, I think the lessons are simple. To what degree do we feel that we're entitled? Or are we just unprofitable servants? Do we recognize that I owe him? He doesn't owe me. I need to serve him. And if I have to do double duty, and if I have to do triple duty, if I have to do overtime, I'm unworthy. I'm just doing my duty. And I'm doing it out of gratitude. Because he healed me. And folk, again, I believe that the passage is simply teaching us that when God asks us hard things, let's do them because of what he has done for us. And what he did for us is much harder than anything he's asking us to do. He who knew no sin became sin for us. I don't, we, we will never, until eternity comes, when, once, we're, once we know all things, even as we are known, on that day we will understand what it cost him, as the hymn writer says, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Until that day we will never understand, never mind the, the, the physical suffering on the cross, but taking sin upon himself. We will, th th that is something that is, that is indescribable. Because remember that God in his very nature is repulsed by sin. Jesus would have nothing to do with it. As much as we are often drawn to it. And yet our sins are laid upon him. And he carries our sin and our guilt and our punishment. And because he has first loved me, I want to love him with all my heart. Father, we pray that you'd help us. Lord, these are simple things. We've not said anything this morning, Lord, that is new or novel or that we've not heard before. And yet, Lord, the reality is that every single one of us, myself included, get to times when we feel disgruntled because we're not being recognized, that we're not being rewarded, that we're not, that we're not receiving what we think we are entitled to. And especially, Lord, when we're asked to do things that are hard. Like rebuke and forgive and repent. But, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand that we, we have no rights. We're, we have no entitlements. We're simply unprofitable slaves bought with a price. And, Lord, that we serve you, not begrudgingly or complaining, but we serve you, Lord, because it's our worship. Because you loved us, and Lord, because you saved us. We come back to you, and we fall at your feet, and we say, Lord, we serve you with all of our hearts and all our lives, with all of our strength, with everything that we have. We want to serve you and worship you and glorify you because you loved us and saved us. Help us, Lord, to, for, for, the, for the penny to drop, as it were. Lord, for the reality of this great salvation that you've, you've, you've given to us as undeserving sinners. Lord, help us to grasp the, the enormity of that amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. And Lord, that we would return, not be like those who just continue their lives as though nothing ever happened. And Lord, we do pray for the many this morning who are uh, who just living their lives down at the beach or in the mountains or wherever it is, just living their lives without gratitude, claiming to be saved, and yet they feel entitled. Lord, help us, we pray. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would touch each one of our hearts. Lord, give us a new glimpse of your grace, of your mercy to each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. I pray, Lord, that you'd go with us, keep us, protect us, bring us together again safely on Thursday, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.